Good morning to all of you. So with Institute of Engineering and Technology, Meerut, deemed to be university, and it's center, of, center for Informatics Development Solutions and Applications, SITSA, and Center for Industry 4.0 Technology Studies and Applications, SITSA, welcome the participants from India and abroad for this international webinar series on open source digital technologies towards self-reliant India, Atmanirbhar Bharat. Under this international webinar series, the Centers of Excellence, SITSA and SITSA, have organized several lectures so far. The first one is on open technologies to provision simple and economical IT infrastructure held on 12th September 2020, addressed by Dr. B. P. Balasubramanian, former Deputy Director General, National Informatics Center, and former head, NIC Open Technology Center, Chennai. The second talk was given by Dr. P. K. Mishra on 18th September 2020 on the topic Roadmap for students using free and open source software and reaching goals of Atman Nirbar Bharat. Third one was on open source software and industrial IoT for SMEs by Dr. H.K. Suhas, former Deputy Director General National Informatics Center on 25th September 2020. The fourth one was on free and open source software, FAS, adoption and its business models by Mr. M. R. Rajakopalan, former director, Center for Developing Advanced Computing, CDAC, Chennai, and former director, National Resource Center on FAS, Chennai on 3rd October, 2020. Open data platform for smart digital government was addressed by Mrs. Alka Mishra, Deputy Director General, National Informatics Center on 10th October, 2020. On 14th October, technology imperatives on making India for self-reliance India, self-reliance India by Dr. Kamalesh Kumar Bajaj, former director, certain Ministry of Communication and Information Technology and Founder and CEO, Data Security Council of India and former Deputy Director General, National Informatics Center. The security, the, on 24th October 2020, Dr. Petro Raj Chalaya, Chief Architect and Vice President from Reliance Geo Platform Limited, Bangalore, gave the address on Edge Artificial Intelligence. Today, We'll have the talk by an eminent technocrat of the country, Mr. K. Rajesh Shegar, State Informatics Officer, NIC State Center, Hyderabad, Telangana State and Head Center for Data Governance, National Informatics Center, NIC, Ministry of Electronics, Information Technology, Government of India on Data Governance and for, for Self-Reliant India. Technology is some of techniques, skills, methods, and processes used in the production of goods and services or in the accomplishment of objectives such as scientific investigation. Topic in the webinar series is a growing list now. Technology imperatives, open systems, open infrastructure, open source software for open infrastructure, open hardware for open infrastructure, open data, open data platform, human resources development on open sources the software, startups in open technology, open society, society 5.0, industry 4.0, example pharma 4.0, textile 4.0, agriculture 4.0, etc. Edge computing, edge artificial intelligence, data governance, deriving big value from big data analytics at indiamail.com and so on and so forth. On 
15th May 2020, Honorable Prime Minister of India, Shri Narendra Modi, has announced Atmanirbar Bharat, Self-Reliant India, as a vision for making India a self-reliant nation, rested on five eyes, intent, inclusion, investment, infrastructure, and innovation. And based on five pillars, namely economy. In this economy in India needs quantum jump and not incremental. Infrastructure, one that represents modern India, system, 21st century technology driven, vibrant demography, source of energy for self-reliant India and the demand, whereby the strength of our demand and supply chain should be utilized to full capacity through a special comprehensive economic pack package of 20, rupees 20 lakh crore that accounts for 10% of India's GDP to bring the economy back on track, which we are now witnessing. He also, you know, emphasized vocal for local to make it global, a demand-based economy system, which is self-producing and self-consuming. The reforms announced have been systematic, planned, integrated, interconnected, and futuristic for creating strong enterprises, generating employment, and a robust supply chain. This is our intent. Today, the topic is on data governance for self-reliant India. Data for development, informatics-led development, internet-led development, internet-led economy, etc., etc., was the basis for establishment of National Informatics Center by Government of India way back in 1977. Data governance. Data governance is, is, is very important because we have spent a lot of time more than three, you know, more than four decades in data management. Data management and the data governance are not the same thing in concept or in practice, but they are both essential to ensure the successful and valuable use of data in an organization, in government, in local body administration, in enterprises, in SMEs, in household. Once the data management process are established, data governance is a logical next step. From cloud to edge, data gets generated. Farmers produce lot of data from their own farm, but they don't want royalty for the data, and the corporates use this data for give them back through you know input supply chain. We need a data governance framework. Implementation of a successful data governance framework is the need of our data governance what are we expecting this is a key for, to delivering big value through big data data governance is one piece of smart big data strategies it is a time for us to understand our data whether it is structured or unstructured and govern it to mitigate compliance risk and fuel like develop ops it is data ops for data hungry citizens what are the things which the data governance will talk about organization which uses data which generates data which makes policies data policies data catalog data and analytic definitions data sourcing data quality and master data data operations and the data security. We had data centers. Now it is data centric. And data governance. It has parameters for accessibility, data security, quality, knowledge, and ownership. Hence, we have technology. And the data governance is for economy. 
security and law and human rights. European Union has plans to rewrite the rules for the internet. European Union is often considered a global front runner in setting rules for the digital sphere. When it comes to for, when it came to into force in 2018, Central Data Protection Regulation, General Data Protection Regulation (GDPR), revised and harmonized outdated data protection rules that had been in place since 1995, and established a regime based on data protection as a fundamental human right, and set a global standard for modern privacy protection. The European Union is now on the verge of writing another potentially standard setting law for the digital sphere, the Digital Services Act, DSA. The DSA may have even a greater impact than the GDPR on the way major internet firms do business. Whereas the GDPR harmonized and in many countries raised data protection standards, the DSA is not limited to one specific policy field, but aims to establish a comprehensive framework for how digital services operate in Europe. This is also needed in India because India is moving towards digitalized economy, a platformization of economy. It will cover services ranging from Uber and Amazon to the App Store and Facebook, and its rules will span liability, competition, employment, and advertising. This goes way beyond the rules in the e-commerce directive, which the DSA is meant to replace and expand upon. There is recently an article by Mr. Anirudh Burman in CarnegieIndia.org on the title, Will a GDPR style data protection law work for India? India has taken steps to enact a data protection framework model along the lines of GDPR. In July 2017, the government of India appointed a committee of experts and a data protection framework for India and a data protection or a data protection committee under the chairmanship of Justice B. N. Sri Krishna to study issues related to data protection in India. Though the committee submitted its report and, if, and proposed a comprehensive law on data protection on July 27, 2018, Mr. Anurath, Anurath Barman says it failed to weigh the economic costs and benefits of implementing a GDPR style law in India. Emerging economics like India, he says, that are considering such proposals needed to carefully evaluate the direct and indirect costs of such laws vis a vis the benefits from a data protection framework. A survey of existing literature that estimates these costs and benefits highlights the need for further research on data protection laws. There have been discussions on personal data and community data protection. Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology has established a committee of experts under the chairmanship of, you know, this is, I talked about it. There is a need to recognize the economic dimension of data and suitable taxonomy of data, aggregated data, derived data, anonymous data, e-commerce data, and artificial intelligence training data, etc. Access to and control over various kinds of data is critical for economic advantage. There is a growing trend towards platformization of digital economy. And Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology has established a committee of experts under the chairmanship of Sri Grish Kopal Krishnan, co-founder, Infosys, to deliberate on a data governance framework, non-personal data, and recommend measures. This committee was set, you know, set up on 15th September 2019. Dear friends and participants, we welcome, on behalf of the Chancellor of the Soviet Institute of Engineering and Technology, Meerut, and Soviet University at Gangos, Haranpur, Uttar Pradesh, 
and the vice chancellors of both the universities and on behalf of the faculties of both universities and on behalf of the four centers of excellence as chairman and professor emeritus i am very glad to invite all of you from india and abroad for very important topic on data governance for self reliant india by none other than mr k rajeshekar he is a veteran in the field he is a highly decorated technocrat in india and mr rajeshekar is is a state informatic officer national state, state, state center hyderabad telangana state and head center for data governance national informatic center nic ministry of electronics and information technology government of india mr rajeshekar has won over 30 national and international awards for various initiatives in the information technology and communication sector which includes three national e governance awards by the department of administrative reforms and public grievances government of india and he is the only cto to receive twice the digital transformation leadership award for contribution made in the information technology sector to his credits mr rajeshekar has architected and implemented several hyperscaling secured national level e governance solutions including first aadhar enabled payment systems first dpt applications first indian government blockchain solutions he authored and published and presented over 30 research articles in the national and international journals including in ieee and springer journals mr rashigar has nearly 30 years of work experience in the information technology and communication field and gained several man years of divine knowledge in 30 sectors of social economic development his research interest include artificial intelligence machine learning security issues blockchain iot enterprise mobility management big data analytics remote sensing and gis data governance local language computing biometrics etc etc mr rashegar i worked with you for more than 3 decades when i was in service i know your contribution your sincerity and implementation and as a state informatic officer in more than 3 states started your career you started in the state of meghalaya as a state informatic officer then the combined andhra pradesh state as a sao and now telangana state as a state informatic officer and your contribution in agricultural informatics is well known mr rashigar i welcome you to deliver the talk today on data governance for self reliant india over to you good morning sir thank you very much thank you for a uh, elaborative introduction to the topic and also very good uh, in, uh, introduction thank you very much sir for your kind words and uh, now i will just uh, share my uh, presentation uh, i'll just share my screen is it uh, visible sir yes yes visible carry on yeah good morning to all of you i thank all of you for giving me this opportunity especially uh, professor noni former director general for uh, giving uh, this opportunity today the topic is uh, as uh, all we know importance of data governance for self reliance india uh, so actually uh, this uh, agenda today's agenda is why data governance and uh, what is data governance how to do data governance and uh, what are the examples of lack of data governance and uh, how data governance is important for research and development 
and how data governance is a prerequisite in the in this days of artificial intelligence iot and the industry 4.0 and how data governance is a, uh, required to mitigate the risk of cyber attacks and ransomware attacks and ensure cyber security and uh, during covid pandemic all this data governance is going to be very much useful the principles of data governance the uh, ugdpr and data protection act of the government of india and data governance maturity model and the uh, digital life cycle management system which we have developed and the uh, d4d that is a platform data governance platform what we have developed from center for data governance the best practice examples and uh, our indian uh, examples of uh, uh, uidi jam that is jam aadhar mobile e sign digital locker so these are the things actually i will talk about there is some echo uh, why this echo is coming i think uh, if everybody mute their mic this echo will go perhaps uh, the basic principles of data governance are accountability standards and protocols stewardship data quality transparency and alignment with the objectives of the organization the accountability is foremost important and uh, there should be a data co governance council or an apex body in the organization which shall take the responsibility for framing the rules and regulations and standards and protocols and those standards and protocols and the rules regulations and rights should be communicated to each and every stakeholder and every person in the organization or if they are dealing with multiple organizations and with the other organizations and the other stakeholders also those should be communicated precisely and there should be a clearly well defined stewardship should be defined so that entire data the stewardship will ensure imposition of the rules regulations and he will become answerable so he owns and in one way and he will be answerable to the organization in Im implementing the data governance principles and practices and the another foremost important thing is the data quality and uh, that is a uh, prerequisite and also in uh, transparency end to end transparency so that the data subject or the data owner should know and we should take the permissions uh from the data subject or the data owner while transforming and for using the data and also it should be used for the purpose for which it has been collected and uh, the data governance standards and protocols principles should align with the objectives of the organization that is also much more important so these are the basic six principles of data governance and uh, now if i uh, so this way this data governance principles goals and data alignment and uh, process management if we see from the data governance elements these are the, this is the example of uh, uh, the principles of uh, first uh, the personal information protection act of uh, africa in in this they have actually there are seven uh, principles purpose specification process limitation security safeguards information quality openness accountability and data subject to participation even in new gdpr or most of the countries more or less the basic principles on this principles only everybody is actually uh, framing their data governance uh, uh, apps and the frameworks in in the entire uh, world and uh, in line with the standards and apps and uh, legal uh, provisions the organization should create their own data governance frameworks and also the processes so that they get aligned and ensure compliance legal compliance uh with the local governments as well as with the international governments for example if you are processing the data of a european in you he may be located in india or in any other country also uh, the processing agency they come under the purview of the eu gdpr and they need to pay penalties or they need to undergo the punishment so that is the that is that much powerful that act is so all the countries are because nowadays in the digital economy the data will not uh, is all pervasive is available everywhere and uh, get may get processed in multinational so these are all very much important and uh, in india 
before going to the india i just wish to uh, show a slide uh, to a small video clipping on the example in the Euro in the europe about a country a small country which has actually uh, managed the data of entire citizens in their country and uh, they are able to have a, as a result as they collected the data digitized and provided the digital identity cards and based on that they are able to achieve the economy and uh, so i request mr manish to play a small video clipping on uh, estonia the capital of estonia the baltic country is home to 1.3 uh, million people and to one of the most advanced yeah. digital societies in the world Explain from e-residency e to online sharing. voting to national id cards we're here to see how Estonia can be a blueprint for other countries looking to go digital. For our first stop, we went straight to the top with a visit. Shall I stop sharing? Uh, because it is not visible to me, the screen, uh, whatever we are playing. Mr. Manish. To Estonia's president, Kirsty Kelulai. If you could describe Estonia's digital society to someone who's maybe never heard of it before, what would you say? You can apply for a passport, you can apply for a driver's license, you can sell your car and buy a car online, register it online. So most of the services in Estonia, when it concerns public service, uh, is digital. We have a generation who has grown up knowing that uh, you communicate digitally. Estonians realized because they embraced the internet and technology, business and everything is going to move to the internet. Instead of just having an offline ID card, you also need something that works online. So we are inside the showroom of eEstonia, which showcases a lot of the country's digital solutions. We're going to take a look at the electronic ID and digital signatures. Every Estonian is issued a digital ID. Physical ID cards are paired with digital signatures that citizens use to pay taxes, vote, do online banking, and access their healthcare records. For a small country, the impact of the digital signatures has been big, saving the government an estimated 2% of GDP per year in salaries and expenses. Estonia says 99% of its public services are available online 24-7. It takes under five minutes to fill out taxes online, around one third of citizens vote online, and 99% of prescriptions are issued electronically. Health records can be shared among doctors using a single electronic file that the owner can see at any point in time too. So here you can see a list of doctors that I have been in treatment with. Everything that regards your health record, your health, this is here. So another big feature of Estonia's digital society is the e-residency program. This basically allows you to start a company here in Estonia, even if you're not a resident. E-residents can benefit from the European Union's single market without actually living in the EU. Estonia was the first country in the world to offer e-residency. And so far, more than 50,000 people have applied for the program since it launched in 2014. So we are on our way to meet with Tavi Kotka. Tavi is a well-known presence in Estonia as the country's first chief information officer. We just started to think about it, like how can we can increase the amount of people who are connected to Estonia. We had to like approach this question differently and we took the approach that, okay, why not we connect them digitally? So how did Estonia become so high tech? It all started in 1991 when the country gained independence from the Soviet Union. The government embarked on a series of fast track reforms to modernize the economy, and it saw investments in technology as a key way to boost economic growth. By 2000, all schools were equipped with computers, and today children as young as seven years old learn how to code. The government also offered free computer training to 10% of the adult population. These efforts helped raise the percentage of Estonians who used the internet from 29 in the year 2000 to an impressive 91% in 2016. Skype was one of Estonia's early tech success stories. The video chatting company, which was bought by Microsoft, was founded here in 2003. Estonia claims it's home to more tech unicorns, which are private companies valued at more than $1 billion per capita than any other small country in the world. Its recent unicorns include payments company TransferWise and Uber competitor Taxify. Other companies focusing on everything from blockchain to organic food are now vying to be the next Estonian unicorn. I think the environment that they set up right now is, is very friendly and I hope they keep it this way. So the road to a digital society here in Estonia hasn't been without bumps along the way. 
In 2007, the country suffered a massive cyber attack, which forced the government to take steps toward protecting online security. Estonia helped launch a branch of NATO devoted to fighting similar attacks. The government created a data embassy in Luxembourg where it stores copies of all of its data. And schools teach cyber hygiene starting in elementary school. The efforts haven't stopped cyber attacks altogether, but today many people here are convinced their data is safer online than on pen and paper. You actually see who has access to data, what data was collected, why, how it was used. And, and if you have an ability to control that, you can cover it, you can delete it, etc. It actually gives you more privacy. One thing we learned about Estonia's digital society, it's not enough just to keep up with technology. As its population ages, Estonia is trying to lure in high-skilled workers like digital nomads, remote workers who use technology to do their jobs anywhere around the world. We're heading in to meet Carolee Hendricks. She's the CEO of a company called Jivpatical. She's working with Kilo Vansi from the Estonian Interior Ministry to develop what would be the world's first digital nomad visa. It's one example of a public-private partnership at work. It really reflects on uh, what uh, our whole immigration policy is about. We want to attract uh, talented people, entrepreneurs that are beneficial to our society, to our economy. Do you see it as important to be attracting skilled workers? The loudspeaker of the world, which means uh, in the United States right now or Brexit, it kind of seems that loud is closing down, but there's a lot of countries who are actually thinking about how to make it easier, how to attract people. Where people will move will very much define the um, failure or success of economy, right? So we're seeing how initiatives like the Digital Nomad Visa and e-residency are encouraging startups and entrepreneurs here in Estonia. This is the Tenopol complex. It's home to more than 200 tech companies. Rick Gruss founded a health tech company whose app helps detect early stages of skin cancer. The small environment, the digital environment, people are um, very open for new innovations. As a market size, it's not that big. So you really have to think big at the very first step and think of your growth plans into other countries and other continents even. Replicating Estonia's digital success in bigger, more diverse countries will be easier said than done. After all, the entire population here is roughly equivalent to that of Dallas. But in a world that's only getting more digital, there are a lot of lessons we can learn from this glimpse into the future. Okay, you can, uh, hey guys, Elizabeth, you're coming to you from Estonia. Yeah. So that is uh, the success story from Estonia, the small country. And uh, they have issued a digital identity card. And uh, in India also, we have issued uh, other card. And, uh, but uh, they have uh, derived, they are using this as a digital uh, signature. So all, there are no papers. They sign all the contracts using a digital signature, using their ID, digital identity card. And, uh, and also all the checks or all the bank transactions. So there's no paper transaction. As a result, they are able to save 2% of the GDP. And it seems every year they're able to save uh, the paper size of Eiffel Tower that much is uh, they are saving. And uh, in terms of the time, actually, they are saving enormously. So in India also, we have the other identity infrastructure. We have also the potential. Uh, 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 Mr. Rashi here, your slides are not yes, visible. I'll now uh, share uh, the slides. Yeah, I think uh, slides are now visible. This one you un you know come out and then share it. You do the same process. I think there's a visible. No. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. So in India also now we have seen the example of Estonia, the small country in Europe. And uh, when it comes to India, uh, India is one of the biggest country with uh, 130 
two or thirty five crore population, but still we are able to uh, in the past several years, we have several initiatives the government of India has taken, broadband highways, universal access to mobility, uh, mobile connectivity, information for all, public in access. A public internet access program, e-governance, informing government through technology, and e-kranti, electronic delivery of services, information for all, electronic manufacturing, IT for jobs, and early RMS program. These are the nine pillars of the digital India. And uh, with this, uh, based on these nine pillars, India could uh, make a lot of uh, ad advancements in the e-governance uh, domain. And uh, but still, actually, we uh, uh, we could achieve a lot. And I just uh, there are also some of the issues uh, which we need to. Uh, there are some areas where there are gray areas. For example, uh, where we need to address so that uh, India can achieve this uh, self-reliance because we have all the infrastructure and uh, now the data governance framework. If it can be imposed along with the Data Protection Act, because data governance is a prerequisite. But this data governance in place at the government of India level, at the state government level, and also at each organization level, if we can impose, which is actually lacking at present, once we add this component, then we will be able to achieve the maximum benefits out of the infra, uh, investments, whatever we have made in the IT sector, and achieve successfully and uh, efficiently the industry 4.0 objectives. And uh, some of the uh, examples, though we have actually automated uh, the property registrations, uh, there are some property scam actually, there is a mortgage and receipts dates. The, the, uh, the persons who mortgage their properties, they, some scamsters are using those uh, documents to change the ownership of the properties. So this is what he actually a, a newspaper uh, report on the scans and uh, uh, of course now in India because of our in, uh, this uh, several initiatives the data is growing exponentially as a result as an emphasis the data governance is very much vital and essential and uh, now because of the invest uh, investments India has made in the mobility as uh, infra uh, in creation of infrastructure and also in uh, creating uh, Janadan, Aadhaar, and uh, mobile. So mobile access, uh, internet, uh, and also uh, idea providing other enrollments, and also opening up uh, zero balance uh, Janadan accounts. Because of this, and also crediting amount directly to the beneficiary's account. The, as a result, government of India, in India also, we were able to save uh, several thousands of crores or rupees uh, for example, the Minister of Petroleum Natural Gas, because of the DBT directly, that is uh, the DBT trans, uh, transfer, uh, transfer of the subsidy amount due to LPG, they could save, uh, they could plug a lot of leakages and 59,599 crores of rupees annually they could save. This is the figure as in March 2019. And in the public distribution system, 47. 1000 crores 633 crores of rupees they could say because because of the other identity they have they could eliminate duplicate uh, ration cards and duplicate beneficiaries so that is actually that's how the within a few years india has also transformed and uh, made best use of the other identity infrastructure and also the uh, the Financial inclusion programs what government of India has taken up by opening zero balance accounts because of that they could transfer and in the case of rural development that is basically the uh, NGN Nariga uh, 21,306 crores of rupees in a year they could save minority affair that is basically the scholarships uh, to the students post metric and pre metric 159. Uh, Crores of rupees have been saved. Social justice and empowerment. This is basically 335.51 crores of rupees. Basically, they're all uh, for scholarships, uh, pre and post metric scholarships, and other uh, welfare schemes for the uh, weaker sections. So, so, this is the amount of what they could save. And in the case of women and child development, that is Janani Suraksha Yojana or uh, 
other uh, other such uh, schemes government of india is implementing successfully they could save to 1523 crores of rupees in a year so department of fertilizer also through dbt they could save actually 10000 uh, rupees so this how actually merely massive good amount of amount government of india could save through the dbt scheme this became possible because of the uh, other identity infrastructure by governance there is a single source of truth the uh, the data is not uh, replicated in different silos and uh, the information from other uh, cidr and uh, the npca and also the line departments because the, the uh, most of the schemes are implemented by several multiple organizations the information across these organizations is moving in the real time there is a standard framework for exchange of uh, information and for protocols as a result we could achieve this uh, success in the country and uh, now another benefit uh, of e sign as in the case of uh, estonia we have also in india launched e sign facility because it typically, typically a company director they wish to sign because once in a year or twice a year they may uh, submit their income tax tax returns or their company uh, annual statements to the registrar of companies and during that time they need to digitally sign only once or twice a year they need to sign but typically if they take a usd digital signatures certificate token it will cost them 800 to 1000 rupees or 1200 rupees whereas this e sign facility with the 2 rupees per sign they can just make a signature so in a year they can only they are making 2 3 times or 10 signatures it hardly cause them some 40 50 or some uh, very uh, small amount so this is uh, how the other uid is that is central identity data repository is there on the fly the kva that means that know your the basic data of the customer or the signature signatory will flow on the fly and uh, the application gets integrated and uh, e sign happens and this is also legally valid as in the case of a or, uh, ordinary digital signature so that uh, legal sanctity government of india also has given so this is one infrastructure so without a digital signature token one can sign we have implemented successfully this uh, because uh, government of andhra pradesh they have given distributed tablet pcs to the gram panchayat secretary uh, secretaries because uh, distribution of desktop systems uh, to them is a costly affair so the government has given uh, uh, tablet pcs and uh, making them sign for various services uh, citizen services what they render like uh, uh, birth certificate or marriage certificate or uh, or water tap connection or mutation of the property or property valuation or for house building uh, uh, permissions or for uh, permissions for establishment of small scale industries or medium scale industries or large scale industries all these services the gram panchayat uh, provides and or i uh, ngnr is a job card so these are the some set of services the gram panchayat provides to the citizens we have digitized all that but one question what we got is when they have when uh, they have only a tablet pc or a smartphone how they can sign digitally and issue a certificate so we have introduced this when the government of india has launched this uh, the uh, digital india program and we are the first in the country to implement e sign in andhra pradesh and successfully cost effectively all the field level functionaries could uh, sign and digitally give uh, the certificates to the citizen so that's how similar this can be replicated by other sources and uh, as i have been explaining the 30 crore uh, janadan accounts are opened uh, zero balance accounts uh, and uh, 120 crore uh, aadhar cards are issued and 118 crore mobile phones are being used in the country because of this trinity janadan aadhar and mobile we could uh, launch other such services to the citizens like aadhar enabled payment systems so that uh, the citizen can do without uh, the citizens who are bottom of the period who may not have a mobile wallet or a credit card or a debit card or an internet bank account because during the demonetization time uh, the empowering the bottom of the pyramid became a challenge and during that time what actually we have done is we have started this aadhar enable payment system in the ration shop so the old age pension gets credited and the, the other benefits to the Uh, bottom of the pyramid poor, uh, poor uh, citizens gets credited by first 
of every month and by second or third they can go to the fair price shop and they can put their finger and they can uh, transfer from their bank account to the bank account of the fair price shop dealer in a cashless manner within in the real time within fraction of seconds the 50 rupees or 80 rupees or whatever may be the ration amount so that is one successfully has been done we have started this now uh, subsequently this has become a, a success and uh, they can deposit cash they can withdraw the cash they can do ba balance inquiry they can do fund transfer all these are possible because of the other enabled payment system this is the digital uh, financial inclusion uh, system uh, secure other based infrastructure which government of india has created and uh, if you see from 2015 to 2019 uh, imps and uh, through debit cards or credit cards or nft rtgs atm transactions checks checks is actually there is a uh, negative decrement only less than uh, so Whereas uh, only 9% ATM transactions, 11% RTGS, NEFT 26%, credit card 30%, uh, uh, percent, debit cards 53%. And uh, so, whereas this uh, other enabled payments is that mode of transactions has increased 782 times in this past five years. So, this is one advantage which, uh, uh, which perhaps uh, we can actually further introduce such type of innovative um, processes and methods for uh, for development of the base business because so far this basically government is being using and uh, otherwise other uh, players also the private companies entrepreneurs also can make use of this infrastructure and uh, the systems and the apis which government of india has created and another uh, one success story of this uh, Jami Jantan Aadhaar Mobile plus the land records computation and other seeding of the land records uh, because usually the a lot of subsidy amount government of, uh, government organizations provide to the farmers and usually the farmers they stand in the queue for one or two days also to get the subsidized amount and uh, we have successfully used this infrastructure to eliminate the queues in Andhra Pradesh. So farmers, first day they were having apprehensions, but second day they have understood whatever subsidy, seed or inputs or fertilizers or pesticides or, in, or manures or whatever, the subsidized uh, inputs, whatever due to the farmer, will, they will get. What we have done is a mobile application where the, uh, the functionary, agriculture department functionary goes to the respective villages and uh, the farmers assemble in the village and uh, they will put their uh, this mobile smartphone has a small fingerprint reader and the farmer will feed his other number and authenticate with his fingerprint uh, finger uh, print that's all and uh, we will we are fetching from the land records data whether the farmer is a small scale a small scale farmer or a medium scale farmer and uh, how much uh, if he is a small scale farmer then only is eligible and uh, how much subsidy also it will be visible and uh, we are actually fetching the family members' data from the ration, uh, ration uh, database. And uh, we are actually also uh, fetching whether he's a licensed uh, farmer, because sometimes the all the farmers may not own the land. There are some licensed uh, uh, farmers who do cultivation and they take on lease the land from the landlord. So those farmers are also, they are the real, uh, they are the real deserving uh, farmers. So to those farmers also, we have. Uh, created a database so we check the authenticity of the farmer and then we are checking the land ownership details and we are checking the stock available details and uh, then we are issuing a e permit a e permit is a unique number a sms goes to the farmer in his local language he will show and he will carry the uh, subsidy those bags of the seeds or inputs and he will go and the queues were eliminated and this uh, this is a dbt uh, platform what we have created based on Aadhaar, based on uh, all the digital platforms uh, and databases whatever we have created so with the proper governance uh, structure so the farmers have seen the benefit and uh, they have now uh, they're all assured that whatever benefit uh, they are due to them they will get only when they put the finger they're only uh, the system will act. Otherwise, they used to keep their chapels in queue for 24 or 48 hours, and some farmers have even uh, died during that uh, 
uh, standing in the queue those were the news stories earlier so this is one new system which we have introduced in the uh, country and uh, another is aadhar enabled the public distribution system in the entire country the government has uh, introduced this uh, scheme where the uh, the beneficiary will put his fingerprint and uh, the he can go to he can walk into any ration shop in the country because during this uh, uh, covid lockdown period the migrant laborers they moved here and there so irrespective of their location whatever due the ration if he has come from maharashtra to andhra pradesh or andhra pradesh or telangana to tamil nadu or whatever maybe he can go to any nearest fair price shop and he can uh, draw the ration so that's how the entire portability has been uh, ensured the competition also has been created transparency has increased because of digitization of the ration cards aadhar seeding of the ration cards elimination of the bogus ration cards and end to end supply chain management transformation wherever the all the stakeholders they put their finger they authenticate they receive the stock so everything has been transparently ensured so this with a cost cost effective technology based on aadhar identity data infrastructure and also uh, the aadhar enabled payment system integrated with the npca national payment corporation of india which is a payment switch connecting 100 plus banks so with this uh, all existing infrastructures we could achieve all this because of meticulously planned data governance principles and uh, practices and uh, this anyhow i have explained about the dbt uh in the case of lbc cylinder there are multiple stakeholders uh, data is from the uh, public sectors which are actually distributing the cylinder to the uh, sub, uh, the the paper paper shops or those other stakeholders the multiple stakeholders are there this is another success uh, story but uh, there are some uh, issues once uh, what has actually happened as this processor uh, becoming more and more faceless because these processes are becoming more and more faceless and we need to have uh, rigorous principles otherwise they will face some problems and uh, we need to ensure the participation of the individual that means for example if i am crediting if a person has uh, two three bank accounts to which account uh, the amount has to be credited so that we should know otherwise recently during covid time also we have distributed subsidy amount and uh, the beneficiaries were wanting the uh, subsidy they were uh, they were checking in a, they have a account in two three banks two banks but they are checking the uh, they are going to the uh, one bank and the banker says no amount has come but actually amount was credited to a different bank account so this type of uh, things uh, we, because this is because of the lack of data governance uh, we should have ensure participation of the individual while crediting the amount we should take the consent by sending a mobile or we have to stress uh, right so that is uh, very much required otherwise is this small uh, principles if we adopt then this, the programs becomes much more successful now for example 47 crores of rupees to 23 lakh customers uh, subsidy amount it was not credited because they when over a period on uh, overnight actually the atl has opened because they got a bank uh, license and they have a, a opened the accounts at the click of a button the atl customers they have opened the atl bank accounts and uh, the amount the subsidy amount went to, uh, went to the newly created uh, atl bank account and where are they are checking in the traditional bank so that was another issue uh, so this uh, data governance practices and principles we need to adapt while uh, implementing the schemes and another important thing is we have we have been regularly seeing uh, the pan card errors though we may submit online the data and we submit all the testimonials but still there are some manual uh, interfaces are there as a result there still some spelling mistakes happen because the uh, the, the work has been uh, outsourced to some agency and uh, the we may pay around 200 rupees and the income tax department is also paying some 30 rupees or so in spite of spending that much amount still the errors are cropping in because the data governance principles we need to adapt in preparing the pan card of course now this government of india says pan card is optional you can use other id as uh, other id also to file the return so that should be uniform another important thing is the customer actually has paid his credit uh, through his uh, bank account the utility bills telephone bills 
and uh, the telephone uh, the mobile sim was actually uh, was uh, he has uh, uh, discarded and uh, the sim was allocated to another customer and the new customer has realized that when he was trying to uh, check he could see the bank balances of the previous customer so the the company which is actually was uh, providing the services they were uh, storing the data as a result this uh, this uh, genuine new customer has complained and uh, ensured that the privacy and uh, financial information of the existing customer was protected otherwise this sh there should be a good uh, data governance uh, principle in place so that if we, if a person is no longer a customer the data should not reside in the company whether it be a telephone company or a bank or whatever maybe so but still this has to be yet to happen and uh, so another important thing is suddenly we see uh, this is a newspaper report only orders uh, uh, they uh, they are all having identity uh, uh, valid uh, voter ids but when they wish to go and vote in their uh, polling uh, booth which they are uh, being they may be doing traditionally for the past uh, several years suddenly they will uh, be told that your name is not in the list so this is also another classic example of lack of data governance in issuing the voter ids or eliminating the voter uh, names from the uh, list another example which we have uh, this is uh, in uh, telangana there is a 10 plus 2 uh, around 25 students have uh, committed suicide 10 plus 2 students because uh, uh, they got around 0 uh, 2.5 score 2.5 instead of 99 the actually the student has got 99 marks but uh, in the mark sheet what they got it is only uh, one or one mark or two so this young uh, children they have lost their uh, lives and uh, the problem is because of the master data management the programmer who has programmed uh, uh, the code they have tested on uh, some set of masters and the uh, real masters are different and uh, the tested masters are different this is a one classic example of uh, master data management uh, mistakes how they can result in such type of uh, uh, accidents or uh, uh, problems another is a lot of other uh, tampering of the card this is another story where uh, end to end processes should be well defined and uh, we should ensure and uh, time to time aadhar has been uh, increase uh, raising the apis and also raising uh, the uh, the guidelines, new guidelines uh, to plug, plug those type of uh, problems. And this is a cla another classic example. This is in Delhi. Total current cycle charges. This is a uh, 85 crores. Uh, one uh, customer has got a bill of electricity bill, 85 crores. So this is another how the mistakes are happening. Though they, the electricity departments are engaging, they are outsourcing to a company. The outsourced company they collect the meter readings and they feed and there are all their persons are there to feed the data to collect the data to verify the data and to ge generate the bills but still this is a one a classic example of how lack of data governance uh, in the entire uh, utility bill generation and uh, ransomware attacks we suddenly open a system we have been uh, in uh, two years back uh, one cry or no one cry, Pintia, no Pintia, this type of viruses actually suddenly they say you pay this much amount for this, bit, for this Bitcoin and uh, then only your computer gets unlocked because uh, through emails or through different, uh, through different uh, uh, channels, these uh, server kernels are able to uh, lock and uh, do attacks. So, this is another area of uh, very great threat and uh, this. If this is also instead of paying ransom, we should uh, take the back. If you are taken the back of regularly, then these attacks uh, would not. Uh, nobody will venture to attack and then uh, uh, demand a ransom. And uh, uh, these are uh, some of the examples what I have given Indian examples. But it doesn't imply that this lack of data governance is there because data governance is an auto project. It is a practice. It has to be practice. It is not that. You create a set of rules and like ISO certification, you just uh, uh, obtain a certificate and keep it. It is not like that. You have to practice, in, put into practice the principles of data governance in day-to-day -day activity 
on june for example june 2 2019 at 3 pm the google there was an outage of uh, google services except the search most of the services of the google were uh, not available to a lot of customers and uh, the as uh, these are the affected zones in the world where uh, of the google services and uh, the reason was one upgradation which they thought they have applied to uh, particular uh, servers in the cloud which are which are related to a particular small geographical location they thought this will affect only small geographical location because that geographical location the requirement and the scalability concurrency requirements are less so they have tried to uh, minimize the consumption they try to minimize the consumption of the resources but that particular script got applied to the servers uh, 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 over a wider uh, geographical area so lack of those this is also another lack of example of lack of data governance in an organization google also they practice uh, they have their principles of data governance but still this is a classic example and also recently also there were some mail services were affected even uh, uh, office uh, microsoft office services were also affected and google gmail services are also affected within uh, two months back that also happened so one of the reason is not that lack of technology or lack of principles or lack of uh, data governance frameworks or uh, infrastructure but practice putting in practice the principles is also important so this is another example though they have infrastructure and uh, or frameworks everything in place but in reality the, the stakeholders they are not putting in practice these principles so putting in practice also very much vital and essential and uh, when it comes to india we have a ours is a complex country with uh, it is a country of countries i can say because we have huge population and also 120 languages we speak and uh, this uh, uh, yeah uh, so we we need to work out uh, uh, systems uh, which uh, uh, the challenges in india are uh, much more complex and we need to consider this title is not if it is actually this is uh, uh ease of doing business recently to achieve self-reliance india has to attract investors and india has been uh, doing good on construction permits actually we are able to issue construction permits the ranking has come down from 181 to 52 and in the trade across borders we have eased and we have digitized and from 146 in uh, 19, uh, 2018 to 80, the rank actually has come down. Starting a business, 156 to 137. But when it comes to registering a property, the index has increased. And paying taxes, resolving insolvency, these are the issues where India has to address. So we are actually working on data governance principles as well as IT end-to-end -end, uh, using, adopting the best blockchain technology, et cetera, to ensure uh, seamless and secure registration of the property so that the property what you register today they will be uh, you can ensure uh, the ownership and uh, based on the scientific principles so that is actually a need of the hour in the country because the foreign companies if they come and invest and if they take uh, if they uh, purchase some assets and there should be uh, proper authenticity should be there and also the property trans uh, mutations should happen uh, without uh, much latency so these are the some of the issues where the though in entire country this property uh, registration processes are automated very much not only now for the past two decades or so all the revenue department they have digitized but still there are some issues these issues we need to address we have to have proper data governance principles and also scientific principles this is what is uh, really missing in there once we add those elements, then those processes become a robust, trustworthy, so that uh, foreign investors can come and uh, they can uh, uh, also invest and uh, create assets. So another is signed consent, as uh, been telling, this is one important thing, the signed consent, consent of the data subject or the data uh, owner. For example, as uh, Professor Moni has rightly mentioned, the farmers create a lot of data. And this data is being the agencies which collect the data. They use it, they process it, and they uh, derive and uh, uh, they derive benefits out of it by 
uh, 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 by determining or for uh, discovering new pesticides or new drugs or whatever may be. But the real owner is actually is uh, not getting uh, any benefit in the intellectual property rights or uh, any credit. So we need to give the credit to the owners. Similarly, the patient data, a lot of medical information, because India is a huge population during COVID also, a lot of data of uh, the country, if it can be collected, collated, transformed, analyzed, we can actually uh, create a lot of knowledge, uh, report, uh, a lot of knowledge, which can be very much useful for uh, speeding up uh, discovery of the vaccines or the medicines. So, but one important thing is we need to protect the privacy, uh, security, and uh, uh, of the individuals. So individual consent is required. And uh, most of the time in the hospitals, left right center, they collect the medical data, private uh, private, private data of the individuals, but uh, they don't uh, acknowledge. And uh, so this is another important thing where we need to. And uh, what, once the data is collected, if it is collected for a purpose, they should use for that purpose only. They should not use for some different purpose without the, the consent of the owner. So that is another important principle. And uh, there should be right to be forgotten. As we have said, if you are no longer a customer to a Uber or Ola or to a, uh, or a, or a restaurant where you may be off, uh, ordering uh, some food or whatever may be, the data, if you want, they should not uh, uh, store your data even with the stored data, it should be encrypted and the decryption key should be available with the customer. So these are important. Otherwise, uh, they, this will be a threat of uh, privacy, safety, security, and confidentiality. These issues will come. Another important thing is the data minimization. Instead of recollecting the data again and again, we should, uh, whatever data is collected, we should uh, try to reuse with the consent of the data subjects and uh, with an enterprise architecture, that is also another important thing. And uh, privacy by design, while designing the system, we should ensure the privacy, confidentiality, safety, security are all incorporated in the design so that it will not become a post-mortem activity. And uh, it should be uh, right in the design stage, these principles are to be taken into consideration. Another, so. Uh, while collecting the data, so the, while presenting the data, anonymization or encryption or blurring the images. And uh, so these are also very much important. Uh, pseudonymization, these are all very much important. And uh, suppression, randomization, generalization, these are uh, very much important uh, while generating the reports. Otherwise, other number, it gets exactly depicted. We have been uh, working out or a mobile number, or date of birth, or hall ticket number, the customer ID, or uh, other data. So these are all private. Uh, these are all the private data of the individuals, and uh, only the authorized person should have this information for particular purpose. And I think uh, there is we can use these methods to protect the privacy of the individuals, which is a need of the other. Another important thing is now in these days of Industrial 4.0, the IOTs they have been capturing a lot of information like how much uh, time you are spending on the TV channel or how much time you are spending on uh, which uh, uh, URL for, uh, and what information you are accessing and the where you are present or which uh, near to which restaurant or which. Uh, so you will be, you'll be getting uh, pop-ups on your mobile. Okay, you are located here. Now there is a uh, shop here. You can have, uh, you can uh, purchase jewelry here or like this. So there are actually sharing uh, the data uh, because uh, though they may claim something, I mean, uh, the, our smart phones have become smart and they have become part of our uh, body. Most of the time, uh, as long as they are awake, we are uh, near to the smartphone and the smartphone is collecting all our information. So this is another important thing. Where, uh, uh, one important thing is to ensure security and uh, to uh, uh, to promote industry 4.0, there should be standards and protocols should be well defined so that uh, there will be a trustworthiness and there will not be vendor locking. That is another important thing. So uh, at the same time, privacy, ensuring privacy. So because these are all very much important when we are moving and uh, using IoT in a big way. And uh, scientific data also, a lot of data, for example, uh, where, where different organizations are collecting a lot of scientific data. Uh, the huge amount of data, 
and there should be a exchange of information so that uh, the data once collected will not be recollected and uh, they can analyze and uh, they can actually minimize the collection of data because data collection is a costly uh, affair so sometimes uh, a particular uh, like uh, ongc may be focusing on the hydrocarbons mineral exploration corporation may be focusing on the economic minerals and the groundwater department may be focusing on the uh water resources but in case when they are investigating if they come across other structures etc if they can exchange the information then some uh, survey uh, data if they can exchange uh, the some of the surveys can be avoided so this is uh, this is another uh, uh, so there should be protocols procedures for exchanging scientific data which is also absent in the country so there is should be a data governance framework for exchanging scientific data and also similar data in each sector in the country and portability is another important thing and uh, so if you are uh, it should be portable and uh, securely data disposition also safe disposition of the data also very much important because uh, beyond a residency period one should not store the data and the uh, data, data should be uh, disposed of in a safely safe and secure manner so that it will not go into the hands of uh, criminals because for example if somebody has collected earlier this biometric information of uh, the uh, for time and attendance devices local devices so this fingerprint data can be used for uh, for uh, doing the if i know the finger if i uh, the banking transaction using aeps one example i give so this disposition is important so data governance actually once we have a proper data governance paper then uh, we can avoid scapegoating everybody will not blame so the real stakeholder who is responsible because in in the network organizations different organizations in the information value chain they play different roles so who is responsible for what process who is responsible for data collection who is responsible for updating who is responsible for approving who is responsible for transporting who is responsible for presenting it everything if it is well defined then uh, we can fix the problems and we can actually uh, everybody uh, a single person will not be held responsible for the mistakes of some other organization so this is what actually important data governance and uh, non compliance there should be if it is a non compliant there should be punishment like in eu gdpr in india also we are actually contemplating for example in other there is a three years imprisonment and also some 10 lakh rupees so similar uh, punishments also in the forthcoming data protection act they are going to enact but eu gdpr actually has enacted this punishment so uh, in view of this all the organizations even private organization in a small uh, uh food vendor because they also collect data of the customers their mobile numbers their uh, their uh, credit card information such type of information uh, also a small food vendor also may collect but if they are not able to protect the data if somebody hacks and if they uh, and if they cause some losses to the customer who is answerable so this uh, they should uh, own the responsibility and they should undergo punishment then only they take adequate measures of data governance so this is what is actually important that is what is that is what is lacking and uh, data collection and storage is dangerous when it is threatens to data content standards and causes duplicates cannot be understood or easily interpreted it is not accessible or cannot be consistently updated cannot be sustained for long so in case if such type of things you are happening it is better not to collect the data and store so that is another uh, uh, cautious step from the data governance angle and uh, no single entity can ensure complete protection of the data so in this information the, to ensure compliance we need to have pro, pro policies and regulations standards transparency rules so then only we can uh, because then only we can fix the responsibility and uh, the regulation is it is not that a single government or agency uh, data Pro protection authority can impose It, uh, there should be a correlation each individual organization should uh, should also do play a role key role in the regulation and also the government so it is like a core regulation otherwise it is uh, not possible in this complex uh, 
society so state uh, state state can do uh, legislation and executive orders and administrative rules the state can prescribe and uh, co regulation uh, the there can be data governance inspectors and who can inspect and who can ensure compliance and each organization can have a data steward who can implement the policies and who will be answerable otherwise usually the C, uh, the chief executive officer or the owner of the company says i uh, the data everything the chief technology officer knows everything he is a dba and he knows the data i don't know what is actually happening and the chief techno the technology officer or the database administrator says okay uh, the ultimately the owner of the company is different and if something happens also who oh, i am not that much responsible or i may so this confusion is there so with this uh, data governance in, uh, if it is in place then the confusion can be avoided and uh, responsibilities can be fixed and uh, another important thing this enron actually a typical case they have actually projected and uh, enron uh, the company actually underwent losses and they could uh, close down because of it is a typical example of lack of data governance in the organization because they are pre presenting different figures financial figures are different marketing figures are different and production figures are different actual field level figures are different and uh, the decision makers are not getting the actual uh, truth as a result they are taking data decisions based on in, uh, incorrect outdated information as a result uh, ultimately on fine morning they have to close down the company so this is how, how uh, this is very much important nowadays in this fourth in this especially in this uh, days of fourth industrial revolution where competition is there in uh, one has to face a lot of competition and data governance is a prerequisite and uh, there should be a metadata management there should be proper policy there should be processes and there should be a risk management uh, methodologies and uh, and also there should be regulatory compliance and data quality should be there everything should be in place then only one should because organizations are becoming more and more digital they are investing heavily on the digitization they are in, they are in, uh, investing on uh, speeding up their services but uh, they are actually most of the time they are not focusing on the data governance this framework is they are not focusing so this is a vital and essential this is a prerequisite uh, before digitization and uh, i give simple example because pentia or no pentia work right like, every day only 8% of the population of the population surveyed population that taking backup of their desktops and laptops or laptops or pdas or the cloud or whatever maybe they are only 8% of the population and once in a week only 2% of the population once uh, uh, a few times a week 2% uh, once a week 7% and a few times a month 10% once a year hardly 0% once in a while 10% unsure 18% of their unsure whether they are taking a backup or not and then uh, 45% of the responded they have not taken any backup because of this type of uh, practices the ramp, the, the ransomware at attackers and cyber criminals are thriving so if there is a proper data governance framework and principles in the organization at least every day twice a day they take backup and they will not get panicked if some uh, their desktop if is at uh, at uh, attack the water maybe because most of the valuable information is being stored in the desktops not only in the servers so another is we have uh, the data governance also enables because uh, in the in a few criminals uh, the lucky uh, group criminals they have actually launched the pentia no pentia the ransomware attacks and there was a research being done by collecting all the information they could uh, uh identify decrypt the uh, bitcoin wallets which are actually uh, encashed so usually what attackers are doing they are actually creating different bitcoins and they uh, suggest to the different customers different bitcoins and ultimately all the bitcoins they move to a single bitcoin and uh, from the bitcoin they have encashed so this was traced so if there is a proper data governance framework in place in the world then one can trace the criminals also and uh, because nowadays what is happening is criminals are taken upper hand and uh, the dark web they are using left right center whereas uh, their population is very minimum but they are taking lot of undue advantage and if we have a proper data governance structure 
and framework in place, we can easily trace them and nobody will, uh, in future, will be able to go using Bitcoin also. They will not be able to indulge in criminal activities. So that is the advantage of the data governance because we will be able to get uh, the information. So before data governance, it is like unorganized and with the data governance, there will be smooth uh, sealing for the organizations or for even households also. And uh, we have actually uh, created from Center for Data Governance, we have created a data lifecycle management system. So it facilitates managing structured data, unstructured data, semi-structured data, mention related data, log data, storage data, and also it will facilitate disposition and uh, tracking. So that is one product, uh, cloud-based product that we have developed. Another is uh, we have created another data governance platform which facilitates classification of the data, cataloging the data, fixing, defining the ownership, and also lineage, quality, roles, responsibilities, production, storage, privacy, metadata management, data dispersion, data value chain, and compliance standards, residency. And so this is how we actually we have uh, created one B4G platform. Another is uh, we have also created a data governance maturity model. So we have defined a model and uh, based on the model, we can uh, assess uh, the maturity level, data governance maturity level of the organizations and based on the inbound processes and outbound processes and services, technologies in a typical organization, inbound processes will be there and uh, in, inbound processes and processing, outbound processes and services. And they use technology, they use operations, the people will be there, systems will be there. This is the ecosystem. And uh, we can uh, define uh, who is responsible for what. So one can uh, one need not panic at all. Because if in a, in a particular a person, his purview is X. In that purview, if he is complying, then he may not worry. Then uh, otherwise, right now, because of lack of data, go, everybody is is uh, worried because if something happens, everybody gets responsible or the person who can escape can escape and those who cannot escape will be, uh, they'll be punished. So that is a problem at present. So that problem, such type of problems can be avoided if we have a proper data governance paper and uh, auditing and training also we actually conduct. So thank you very much and uh, for giving me this opportunity. I hope uh, I have uh, highlighted on, uh, uh, so, with uh, for self reliance India, uh, what is not true because it is uh, proper data governance. Otherwise, even for artificial intelligence, also uh, for discovering the knowledge or for uh, uh, new knowledge, it a lot of uh, data is required. The data quality is not there. Data quality. If, if there is a proper data governance framework, then data quality will be there and the prediction will be accurate. Otherwise, in the inaccurate predictions will happen. So, prerequisite for artificial intelligence or deep uh, industry 4.0 is a proper data governance. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for giving me a once again. Thank you, Mr. Raj Figer. Uh, it is, uh, it is, uh, one hour, uh, you know, 23 minutes presentation addressed by you. It's uh, you addressed in a very important topic data governance for self reliant India through examples. And uh, as I, you know, I, I know, you know, it is, it is, it's a big thank for you because. You, you you have brought out a lot of technology issues which are which are being done on a on a you know solo manner but the data governance as a foundation you know you you have come out with a lot of examples and so on and so forth if an organization has to take a benefit of the data which they generate for it and use for its policy if they don't have a proper data governance they stand to lose. You come out with a lot of examples, and uh, you have shown as a practitioner, as a technocrat, as a scientist, as a bureaucrat, you know, and a person who was involved in informatics led development, digital you know, uh, uh, governance based on digitalization, 
and you have completely given the total value chain why how where and uh, what and what not and how not and why not and where not you know all these are simple five w's and one h you answered very nicely brought it put forward and it, it is not only really, it is starting from an individual who wants to con confirm as an e citizen to the e government for establishing e governance or digital governance is more important because everybody is generating data and uh, you know you started with data governance principles and principles for uh, compliance and how a digital economy has been achieved in a small country like estonia within 30 years of their independence and how india is now after the digital india program has been announced through dbt how much savings is being done and i'm very happy that the you know the you know in order to prepare and you know to data minimization that everybody should work on database on the same database which gets generated from the same source way back in 1985 the national informatics center announced a district information system at the grassroots level in 512 districts to have database development in 28 sectors so that every government department both in central government and state government and local government will use the same data which gets generated on a village rather than everybody generating the way in which they have to generate and uh, replicate which you said it that how enron has failed because everybody has got a different data to you know safeguard them and uh, this was achieved at that time and a uh, horizontal one to facilitate a common village level information that is called district plan so district industry district education district agriculture district uh, you know welfare you know industry and district health and district rural development and so on and so forth i am saying that because i was the project director for the 20 you know district information system program when at that time we didn't have the technology but we were strong on information system that's why when i was given the responsibility for e governance standards formulation as deputy director general in ic in 2005 even though i was given about six you know working group to supervise i also included with the approval of the direct, then director general uh, nic and the secretary you know of the you know information technology a legal enablement of information system Courts are legally enabled, but information system is an economic activity. It's an informatization of economy, intense, digitally intensifying economy. And this information system is economic activity is tradable and hence it has to stand in the court of law. So it needs a legal enablement of information system. And technology, if the information system is strong, that is a foundation for data governance, data generation, data application, data use, decision support system, application of that technology like artificial intelligence, big value from big data, and so on and so forth. So, data, you know, information system and data governance are the two layers of foundation of a building on which the technology the process and the people work on it you very nicely brought out these issues very you know uh, you know effectively and efficiently as a professor teaching the students thank you mr rashigar in short for the benefits of the participants you know i would like to you know uh, you know uh, uh, summarize it mr rashigar the state informatic officer nic state center for the telangana state located at hyderabad today he talked about the need of data governance for self-reliant india he quoted a lot of examples practical examples and uh, you know and uh, both abroad as well as in india india is consist of about 29 states 
and uh, you know about six you know uni seven union territories and so on and so forth and uh, more than 2.25 lakhs gram panchayat and we have to have a data governance for the you know you know central government and state government and local government with the state regulations non state regulations co regulations cooperative sector corporate sector msmes khadi and village industries uh, the, you know to so that this country india is digitally enabled it is it is digitally enabled india you know this is more important so mr rashigar we thank you you talked about data governance is a process of managing the availability usability integrity and security of data in an enterprise system even india to have an you know you know india you know enterprise architecture the data governance is the bottommost layer and which everything has to you know you know rest over there and based on internal data standards and policies that control data usage effective data governance ensures that the data is consistent and trustworthy and does not get misused data policy data quality business policy business process management risk management and regulatory complaints are required for organizations you very rightly said it about master data management many of the public sector undertaking which works on public utility you gave an example electricity bill you know pan card you know that you know until unless you have a very trustworthy master data management master data on citizen on building it is very difficult that's why as a chief advisor uh, it in the department of agriculture and cooperation and farmer welfare in 2018 on 16th august i sent a no note on the need for a national database on farmer amounting to 14 crore farmers you know for digitalization of you know farming sector with about something like 26 categories of uh, you know information uh, you know para info information parameters and which you know everybody who is working on you know agricultural farming you know and farming sector should be in a position to use it it is an asset so and uh, the successful organization are increasingly relying on data to take decision you rightly said it government of india state government going up to the village level offices everybody has got computing devices it is edge devices but there is no data backup policy data centers are doing backup policy but the individual desktop systems uh, you know on on an offices uh, you know desk or the mobile phone government you know the government mobile phone or even the personal mobile phone or the laptop nobody takes the backup and that's the reason only i was when i was in service that how the librarians are doing backup you know library science people have to be injected for e governance services in a very effective manner you know this is an important thing for the note of the government to you know do the needful data governance is for improving efficiency effectiveness of an organization in the long run it is not a short term goal our objective is to modify the data governance structure to further improve the efficiency and effectiveness levels in meeting the organizational objectives besides ensuring compliance to data related acts and rules amidst these and other data challenges successful and sustainable data governance is becoming a top priority for organizations such as governments that want to ensure that reward and recognition are our right persons are involved in determining standards usage and integration of data across projects subjects areas and the lines of businesses data governance related to data sourcing you rightly said it data quality and master data data operations data security 
data organizations, data policies, and data storage and catalog, and data and analytic definitions. This talk focused on how to make an intelligent data governance plan to enable the future of value systems and organization. Mr. Rashegar, after listening to your very effective and uh, you know efficient and the provocative address on the data governance for self life India. The Soviet Institute of Engineering Technology, through its centers of informatics development solutions and applications, SITSA, and Center for Industry 4.0 Technology Studies and Applications, SITSA, decided to run and launch a program, maybe a diploma course and big diploma course on data governance to train our engineering graduates and our science graduates of both graduate level, BSc, BTEC, and post graduations to be involved in digitalization of you know, economy, even at least in agriculture sector, there are about 400 agriculture commodities value chain, 14 crore farmers to facilitate them on a data governance and how to pay back royalty, royalty on the data governance, data which gets generated from the you know, farmers and other uh, customers, it has to be included uh, as a part of IPR so that the money, the, the, the benefits go back to the data genera generated from the source from where the data gets generated. And uh, you know, we would be very happy to associate you because uh, National Informatics Center as a technology organization I proudly say that it is for my alma mater. I was born and brought up in National Informatics Center, and uh, you know, and uh, and it is an organization which put India on a technology platform. And now many countries in uh, from the different parts of the world are learning from what NIC has achieved during the last forty years, for more than four decades. So we would like to associate you for may, uh, taking this data governance. You know, you know, uh, you know, very forward uh, to this to you know youths who will be in a position to use this infrastructure of a you know as an infrastructure having a system a technology which is a 21st century to make this country self self reliant and an economy which is 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 a quantum which will have a quantum jump. So thank you very much for. Uh, I, I, I you know for delivering a talk on a very important area which consists of a lot of technology pillars a lot of research work is going on a lot of phds are being generated a lot of companies are working on it but data governance nobody is giving that much importance which you are given through a slide that about 45 percent of the people don't even take a backup more than 15 by 15 percent people don't know how to take a backup and this is a very important one to be looked into it and thank you very much please get associated with the center center for informatics development solutions and applications and center for industry 4.0 technology solutions and applications for to make this data governance as as is 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 is, is, is an you know uh, platform is a standard to be used to for you know self reliant india very effectively thank you very much thank you very much and behalf of the chancellor of soviet institute of engineering and technology and the vice chancellors of the uh, university and the faculty members and as the chairman of the centers of excellence uh, you know of the soviet institute of engineering and technology and i Thank all the participants of uh, uh, participating from India and abroad, and also the speaker of the today's you know webinar, Mr. Rajshaker. A yeah, big thank you to all of you. Thank you. We close the session. Thank you.